Korean invasion into South Korea. I lived in New Jersey at the time, and I can remember a headline in the local newspaper, probably the New York Daily News, that said something to the effect, the Marines have landed in Korea again. And it gave a probably not very accurate story about the Marines and Navy who had landed in Korea in 1871. That was the first time I'd ever heard about it. Over the years, being somewhat of a Navy buff and a historian, I kept reading about that. And now with the all the attention on North Korea, it seemed like an appropriate time to again talk about the first Korean conflict. Why were we there? Well, variety of reasons. The original theory was that we sent a naval expedition to stop the piracy that was going on both uh, in the Sea of Japan and in the Yellow Sea. And there may have been some of that, but probably the main reason the Navy was there was to try and get a treaty made between Korea, which was at that time called the Hermit Kingdom because they did not allow any other nations in there, and the United States. After the Civil War, there was an expansionist program in the United States to start up trade with foreign countries, which of course during the four years of the war we were occupied otherwise. There had been an incident in 1866 when a merchant ship, the General Sherman, went missing off Korean shores, most likely was taken by the Koreans, burned, and the crew murdered. That may have been some of the reason for the Navy's presence. However, the Navy had been in those waters even before the war. The, there was an Asiatic squadron there. During the war, the USS Wyoming was in Korean-Japanese waters and actually had a battle with the Japanese in 63 or 64, I believe it was. The uh, French had moved in to, I'll never be able to pronounce this, but uh, why don't we go to the next slide, Ed, to Genwa Island. But before we get to that, probably all familiar with the Korean Peninsula. I, we, I guess I have my own pointer. Uh, uh, Seoul is right about there, and that was the capital of. Korea at the time. Go on to the next one, Ed, if you would. There's Seoul. Incheon is right in here someplace. Go ahead again. In Ganwon Island is here. That was apparently, at that time, the major Korean military installation guarding the approach to Seoul, which was not only the capital, but was uh, sacred land, I guess. The French, 
in 66 had landed a force of about a thousand men on Gowan Island. Don't know what their intentions were, probably imperialistic. And stay there for about five weeks fighting the Koreans. Don't know why it took them so long, but anyway, they did. When they left, they looted all the public buildings that were there. So when the U.S. Navy showed up in 1871, I'm sure the Koreans just looked at us and saw more white guys. You know, all you white guys look alike anyway. And uh, the difference between the French who had looted them and us, you know, uh, you're all foreigners and we've been around here for 4,000 years. You guys are just newcomers. You can't have any culture. Uh, so we really don't want to deal with you. But the Navy, consisting of five ships, would you go ahead, Dave? Led by the USS Colorado, a pre-war Navy frigate with a steam engine. It was primarily used sails, but was steam assisted. You can see the stack there. It was the lead ship of the squadron. Next one. Which also considered, consisted of the USS Alaska, which was a late war ship. Uh, actually, was not commissioned until after the Civil War was over. Next one. The Benicia, which was a sister ship of the Alaska. One of the things about both the Benicia and the Alaska. They were built during the war in a hurry using unseasoned timber. That means they leak a lot. Uh, the Benicia was scrapped shortly after this incident. <laughs> Next one. <coughs> then there was the USS Monocacy, which we'll talk about. And uh, this is a picture, not of the Monocacy, because Mike took the wrong picture, but <laughs> this, is, this is the sister ship of the Monocacy. So the Monocacy looked probably identical to this. Uh, and you'll notice it's a side wheeler, paddle wheeler. We tend to associate paddle wheelers with just river boats, but in the 1850s, that was the paddle wheelers were a standard means of locomotion, locomotion for steamers. The ships that Perry took to Japan in the 1850s were paddle wheelers. Although with that the squadron in 1871, it was the only paddle wheeler that was there. Next one. There was one other ship in that squadron, a tug called a Palos, uh, or Palos, I guess it was. Uh, don't have a picture of that. All of those ships were quite heavily armed because they were warships. The squadron was commanded by Rear Admiral John Rogers, who is there. They also had diplomats with them, and the idea was to meet with the Koreans and discuss having a trade treaty with them. Go to the next one, Ed, I think. Yeah, try the next one. We'll probably have to come back. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Ah. 
These are the Korean diplomats that they met with. And you can certainly see how there would be a clash of cultures here. These guys show up in their funny clothes. They looked at us in our funny clothes. They also, again, looked at us as more white guys, and all you, as I said, all you white guys look alike, and you've been here before, and we didn't like you then, and we don't like you now. There were several, two days, I think, of discussion between the Korean officials and the American diplomats, along with the naval authorities. And probably problems with translation and understanding the culture. Our side pointed out what we wanted to do. We wanted to establish peaceful trade negotiations. We wanted to do some charting of the rivers so that we could move ships up and down them. And through all of this, the Koreans basically didn't say anything. We took that to mean that that was okay, you know, that since they did not object, we assumed that they were cool with that. So now, Ed, we're going to have to go back quite a few. That's good. So after the negotiations was over, we sent a, the, the Palos up through the river here, the Sully River, in China is over here someplace, to map the river. They came back, everything was fine. Then they and the Monaco, the Palos and the Monocacy proceeded up the river. I think we need to go back one more, Ed. Keep going. Keep going. Maybe three or four more. <laughs> what we didn't know was that this bend in the river as far as the Koreans were concerned, was sacred waters. No foreign ship was allowed up there without special permission. Of course, we thought we had permission since nobody had said anything. So when the Monocacy and the Palos got to this bend, the shore batteries here opened up on them. Didn't do any real damage, but got their attention, if you will. The Monocacy fired back and silenced the forts. Now, Ed, we can go forward again. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. When they reported back to the main fleet, which was anchored in here someplace, Admiral Rogers decided that we could not let this go unchallenged. So he discussed it with the diplomat that was with him. Of course, he didn't understand why they were fired on because they thought that they had permission. So they landed a naval and marine party. There were roughly 650 men total. I think there were 109 Marines and the rest were sailors, along with some light artillery, some howitzers. Now, if you, and I'm sure that Marv remembers this, but one of the problems from the Second Korean War 
Uh, one of the problems with landing around Incheon was the tides. Terrible tides, 30 foot tides, I think, which leaves a lot of very big mud flat flats. And even in high tide, if you were to land a landing party on close to shore, they would sink up to their knees in the mud. Uh, and that happened. And they had to drag these howitzers through the mud to the solid ground. Let's go to another one, Ed. Keep going. Keep going. That's it. This shows the monocacy. Now, this photo has been identified two different ways. One says that that is the tug, the palos. The other says it's the monocacy. Well, since it's clearly a side wheeler, and there was only one side wheeler in the expedition, it has to be the monocacy. This shows the monocacy proceeding up the river, towing assault boats that contain the Marines and the Navy landing party. And I'm sorry, Ed, but we, let's go back again. Keep going. That's good. Well, that, that's okay. They landed about here proceeded up to this fort, which the Koreans abandoned, proceeded on up to the main fort, the one that fired on the two ships, towing the artillery, got to about here, and the Koreans had retreated to this major fort. The Navy Marine Force fired on the fort with their howitzers and then attacked it. The first man over the ramparts was a Navy lieutenant named McKee. Irony here. His father, during the Mexican War, had been one of the first men over the ramparts at Chapultepec and was killed. McKee was the first man over the ramparts in this first Korean conflict, and he was killed. One of the only three <coughs> Americans that were killed during the conflict. <coughs> there were several wounded, but not a whole bunch. There were something like 240-some Koreans killed. In the words of one of the Marines, they fought like tigers. But they were using 17th century technology. They had matchlock rifles, small cannon that were mounted on logs, very difficult to elevate or train from side to side. They were using spears and probably, and swords. Go ahead, Ed. The monocacy, no, uh, go back. Well, I guess forward again. There. This is the crew of the monocacy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but third man in, with the big mustache. Is this man. Howard Porter. And this is his uniform and some other of his items. We'll talk about him in a moment. There he is. He was uh, 
by that time a second assistant engineer on the Monocacy. He had joined the Navy, well actually had joined the Army in 1861, right at the beginning of the war, and served in a Pennsylvania light artillery battery for three months. Uh, I think most, at that time everybody thought it was going to be a short war, so the term of enlistment was only three months. <laughs> After that enlistment expired, he then joined the Navy and became a third assistant engineer on various ships, including one called the USS Panola. I served on the third ship by that name during the Second Korean War, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> right at the end. So there is, to me anyway, a connection there. The, might as well go ahead to this. Uh, this is his dress uniform, probably circa 1870s, with his belt and buckle. This is his naval officer sword. And his commission in the Navy in 1861, signed by the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. As I mentioned, he served on several ships, including the USS Monocacy. He was, and I can't prove this, but very likely one of the naval officers involved in the landing of the naval troops because he brought home a souvenir. Now when I first got this collection, I had no idea what this was. It has since been identified, and I presume correctly, as the remains of a Korean, of the scabbard of a Korean sword. I'm assuming that he probably captured the entire sword and scabbard, and over the years, the rest of it disappeared somehow. But that this is the remains of a scabbard from a Korean sword. He had a, probably a fairly tragic career because in, 1874, he retired from the Navy and is listed, at some point he got married, but at, uh, not too long, I think in the, in the early 80s, he is listed as being in the Naval Asylum. That might be because he got married. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that could do it to you. Uh, uh, and I'm not entirely sure what the definition of asylum was at that time. It might just mean a hospital, but anyway, he was in a naval asylum, then got out and ended up in a, I guess what you'd call a soldiers and sailors home, where he stayed until he passed away in 1906. There is more information on him and his career in this binder, which you're free to look at. Back to the assault. Now, go ahead to another one, Ed. I know. Keep it going. All right. This shows the type of weapons that the Koreans had. This particular cannon, which is on display at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, has a date of 1665 on it. That obviously was no match for the heavy cannon 
on the Monocacy and the other ships. One of the, well, two cannons on the Monocacy fired 60-pound shells, and they were rifled cannons, so they were quite accurate. Certainly, things like this had were no match for them. And the private arms, or, or the, uh, the arms of the defenders of the forts, were equally antiquated. And what were the sailors and marines armed with? Quick answer is, we don't really know. The only listing I could find for arms for, for the uh, USS Colorado, and they were arms that the Colorado was issued during the Civil War. And they were sharps. I don't know whether they were the carbine or the rifle. And Whitney pistols, which is what this is. This is basically a muzzle loader with powder and ball down there. You ram the charge down with that, and you put percussion caps on the cylinder. That technology was going out in the late 1860s. In 67, 68, the Navy was replacing the percussion revolvers with a single shot 50 caliber pistol. Seemed to me that was maybe a step backward since that pistol took two hands to load and fire. Also, the Civil War muzzle-loading musket, similar to this one here in the case, was being replaced in 66, 67 with a modified musket called a trapdoor. There is a sample of one of those in that case against the wall. But I have no idea whether the Asiatic Squadron would have been issued those or not. First of all, they were in fairly short supply. The, the modern arms were in fairly short supply when the squadron left for the Asiatic waters. Secondly, I think there might have been some concern about availability of ammunition since that gun and also the single shot took a special modern ammunition. There may have been some concern whether or not that ammunition would have been available uh, in, in Asia. Probably wouldn't have been, so they would have had to have taken a whole bunch with them. Now, they may have, but even if they didn't and were just armed with the Civil War period weapons, those weapons would have been far superior to what the Koreans had. Mention the Sharps. The Sharps was a breech-loading weapon. You would carry cartridges in a box such as this. You would take a either paper or a linen cartridge, insert it there. Bang. You could get easily seven shots a minute out of something like this. The uh, it also had a south priming system, which probably wasn't used all that much. You probably still put a separate percussion cap on here. The south priming system consisted of little pellets. This, this is simply the loader. 
and you would shove it down. There's a spring-loaded chamber here. You shove the little pellets down there, throw this away. And then, in theory, every time you pull the trigger, the pellet would fly out and you'd catch it like that. I suspect in windy conditions that was somewhat iffy. <laughs> uh, I suspect the self primer was not used all that much. Well, I have a question about your, your sharp carving you just going here. I don't think any of us have seen very many of these, but a couple of weeks ago there was a talk here and another sharp carving was on display, and it had a considerable uh, difference in appearance. The barrel and some of the metal parts were just lacking. Well, my opinion on that particular one was somebody had taken probably a fifteen or sixteen hundred dollar gun and turned it into a seven or eight hundred dollar gun. Uh, this was not uncommon in the 1950s when people coming home from World War II and a little later on in Korea rediscovered the Civil War and the earlier weapons and liked to shoot them. And so they would quite often take them to a gunsmith. And very few gunsmiths are trained to work on antique weapons. They are pretty much taught to buff and polish and then maybe blue. Uh, in my opinion, that's what happened to that one. Uh, and I'm not even sure about the wood on that one. It looked pretty new. The one thing about the Sharps, the Sharps company made basically the same guns up until the late 70s, 1870s. And so there were a lot of extra stocks around. And it was not uncommon, again, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, to order these surplus stocks and put them on the guns. Now, I don't know if that's what happened to that one or not, but uh, they were originally, all the metal was blued, with the exception of the receiver, which was case hardened, and the trigger, which was case hardened. I'm not sure about the barrel band, whether that was or not. But both rifles and the carbine were finished the same way. The, uh, as soon as you say that, somebody will say, well, there was one record of one that was finished in the white. Sure, there's always exceptions, but those were just experimental guns. Uh, over the years, the bluing turned sort of a plum brown, which is what these are basically. Uh, you know, uh, I did not examine that gun carefully, but my impression was that it had seen the helpful hands of a modern gunsmith, which uh, they, they've ruined a lot of guns. I, I know a, an example of a fellow I know bought a Civil War musket and took it to a gunsmith to clean up. The gunsmith method of cleaning a gun that had some rust on it, certainly, was to put it in an acid bath. Wouldn't have been too bad, except he got arrested, and three days later, when he got out of jail, went back 
and uh, there wasn't much left of that gun in, in the acid bath. Uh, but even if he had just had it in there for a small period of time, the finish that would have been left on it would have looked like it was a Parkerized finish because all the all the pits that the rust was in would have been cleaned out. Uh, it was very common, I, even when I started collecting, to use naval jelly to, to clean a barrel, and that created the same problem. You, you'd have clean pits, if you will, and a non-authentic finish. Uh, this, the Sharps rifle, is simply the longer barrel version of the carbine. Used the same kind of ammunition, only a little bigger powder charge. The Navy also had a Sharps and Hankins. And they may, some of the ships may very well have been armed with this. Because the Sharps and Hankins, although it came out during the Civil War, prior to the Civil War, used a basically a modern cartridge. A couple of advantages with this. One, you didn't need a percussion cap. Two, it was waterproof. They were, the, the center fire technology that we take for granted now was not in use during this period. It, center fire cartridges, at least in our country, our military did not come into vogue and or in use until the 1866, I think, was the first gun we had that had center fire. These were rim fire, just like a 22, present day 22, meaning the fulminate was around the edge. But this gun would have been available not only during the Civil War, but for the expedition that went to Asia. And it simply opened like that. You'd put the cartridge down, close it, bang. Now, you notice the barrel. The barrel is leather covered. The theory was that by covering the barrel with leather, you would protect it from salt air and salt water. When I bought this, the dealer selling it was describing it and said among the deficiencies of it were these two dents in the side. Well, I had seen a picture of these stored on the inside gunnel of a ship, and they were fastened to the gunnel by a spring-loaded clamp that would have left these dents. So I love these dents because it showed the gun was issued and used. And as most of you know, I consider myself not a gun collector, but a history collector. The, wow. yes? Going back to the landing, how long did it take to from the landing to the final port in battle? Two days. The battle itself uh, lasted a couple of hours. Now, why the French took five days, and, I mean five weeks, and with a bigger party and never accomplished anything, I have no idea. But uh, the assault and the battle, I may be off by a, an hour or so, but it, it was very quick. And again, as the one uh, Marine captain said, the Koreans had no problem with courage. They fought like tigers. 
but we're no match, A, for the better trained American forces and also for the advanced technology of the weapons, even if they were still Civil War period weapons. They were far superior to what the Koreans had. The sailors were also undoubtedly have had a cutlass. This is a Model 1861 Navy cutlass, uh, which seems odd, but I know of folks from World War II that said in the arms lockers of many of the World War II ships, they still had cutlasses in them. Now, I'm sure they didn't use them much, but they were still in the arms locker. You, you never throw anything away. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Eh? These shows three Marines. This is Captain Tipton, I believe his name was, who is the one that mentions how the Koreans fought like tigers. These two soldiers, or Marines, uh, a private and a corporal, captured the Korean flag. For that, they got the Medal of Honor. There were several others uh, in the assault force that were also awarded the medical, uh, the Medal of Honor. Just point out one thing. This, I don't know which ship this is, but this shows the breach of one of the naval cannon. You don't see too much of it, but even from that, you can tell how much superior that was to that little brass one that the Koreans had. Next one. What happened next? Well, that, you know, any what if in history is open to speculation. But as soon as the assault was over, we left. We never did negotiate a treaty with them until uh, the dates up there, I believe, uh, what, 86, 82. Uh, so there was a void in which the Japanese filled. In 76, I believe it is, the Japanese got a foothold in Korea and negotiated a treaty with them. And they stayed. We again finally went back and negotiated a treaty. But Japan was beginning to expand its colonialism, I guess. They fought a war with the Chinese and then with the Russians, won both of them. In 1910, the Japanese annexed Korea and stay there until 1945 when they lost World War II. So, again, these are what ifs. If we had stayed and negotiated a treaty, would the Japanese have been able to move in as they did? Would they have eventually annexed Korea and later moved into Manchuria? and started their East Asian expansion. Who knows? Uh, but that's one of the big what ifs in history. The, we all know the history of Korea after that. Uh, it stayed under Japanese control until the end of World War II when the Russians three weeks before the treaty was signed, uh, the uh, surrender was signed, decided to join World War II against the Japanese, uh, obviously t just to expand their influence, and were able to secure the northern part of Korea, along with Manchuria, and they 
extended their influence to North Korea, the demilitarized zone was established. We had influence in the south. Uh, Russia, China kept influence in the north until the Second Korea War started in uh, 1950 when the North Koreans invaded the south. Uh, the result of that war was a armistice, which is still in effect, sort of. Uh, there was never a peace treaty signed. The uh, northern part of the Hermit Kingdom is still there and is still a problem. That's about all I know about it. Yeah. Did they have to drag those pieces by hand, or did they have draft animals? No, they basically by hand. But these were, right? yeah, they, these were probably boat howitzers. Uh, basically, a I'm assuming, and there's there's not a lot of documentation on this, but the Navy used 12-pound howitzer, short-barreled, fairly lightweight guns. Uh, on lightweight iron carriages with big wheels. Uh, they used them for landing parties during the Civil War. My assumption is those were the same guns that they used. Well, it, it, it sure wouldn't have been easy, but I mean, even, even a light gun I think the barrels on the howitzers weighed about 200 pounds. And then you have the carriages on top of that. They were not the heavy wooden carriages, but you know, he's still got to figure the whole thing was probably three or 400 pounds. I don't really know, but that's my assumption. Second question, as you go back to that uh, photo with the Marines on uh, by the flag, oh, not much too far. They, they look like they have like Springfield based on the and stuff. Yes, but from that picture, you could not tell whether they were muzzle-loading Springfields or the trapdoor Springfields. At least I can't tell, uh, because they would look about the same. That would probably have been, if they had them, that probably what they would have had. And again, they would look, unless you can really see the detail on the breach, which with my eyes I can't, uh, they would look the same as a muzzle loading. Uh, it caught my eye. Okay, yeah. Same length as yeah, well, but that would be the same length as a muzzle loader. Right, right. That's why I and uh, so I don't know. Again, I would historically, going back to the Mexican War, the military was reluctant to take the most modern advancements in technology into a foreign country. Percussion guns were around in fairly large supply at the beginning of the Mexican War. However, the generals felt that they would have trouble supplying percussion caps in Mexico. So the majority of the guns issued were flintlocks because you know you can always just find a flint hill and and, and, and make new flints. I sort of think that, again, the same theory might have been used when they were sending a squadron to the Far East. Let's not equip them with ammunition that they can't easily replace out there. It's all speculation, but that's my speculation. Cool, thank you. You bet. 
have any idea what the uh, translation is on the flag? Yeah, it probably says, oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, it is described as the commander's flag that was being flown on at the Citadel, which was the main Korean fort, uh, presuming, presumably it had some personal identification to him. My impression is it's not a national flag, it's more of an individual flag, but I don't know that for sure. Other question? Yeah, Mark. You mentioned the, uh, the tide differentiation in that area, and it's my, uh, my understanding that nobody thought that MacArthur could ever get those guys across those mudflats. Oh. Uh, and what that, that added to the surprise. Oh, oh, I, I, absolutely. And during your my Korean War, uh, when MacArthur came up with the invasion of Incheon, the Navy guy said, you're out of your mind because you have a very small window of opportunity to get in there and out before all the ships go aground. And they were right. Now, they worked within that very small window of opportunity and uh, actually uh, planned that some of the ships would go aground, as I remember. But uh, tides were terrific in that area. In fact, the only real damage to the ships in the squadron came not from the Korean cannon, which mostly overshot, but from the tides. Uh, both the Monocacy and the Palos were run aground on rocks by the horrific tides. Uh, Palos almost sunk. The Monocacy was holed, but not, not a lot of damage. But uh, apparently the tidal race in that area is terrific. Even though the Monocacy had anchors out anticipating this tide, the anchors dragged and it was still pushed up on rocks. Anything else? Well, thank you for coming. Uh, that's a very brief description of the first Korean conflict. Uh, you're welcome to come up and look at items. Uh, I'd be glad to demonstrate them to you if you'd like. And again, thank you so much for coming. And just something that I like to do at the end of any of my presentations is give a salute to the men involved in that expedition and specifically to Marv's and my experience during the Korean War and also for you, those of you who served in Vietnam and present day, my salute. Thank you. Good job, Marv.